here we go. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're going to give folks a moment to uh, log on here. We have a number of people joining us today. This is Jen Kovich Bordnick coming to you from beautiful, sunny downtown Washington, D.C. Actually, it's quite a um, rainy day here, but um, the wonderful background behind me is sunny. So it's got me in a wonderful mood. All right. Joining us today. Today is our webinar, our part of our COVID-19 series, and we're going to be looking at what HIEs are doing um, to overcome the data challenges during the pandemic. It's a great topic we're going to be discuss uh, discussing here today. We have a really stellar crew with us, which I'm very excited about. So welcome. We're at about one minute before the hour, so we'll give folks a couple more minutes to log on here. Welcome. And we've got a big group joining us today. Welcome, everybody. I am curious about what people are looking forward to the most when they get out of their houses. So <laughs> anybody have any uh, good thoughts there? I never realized how much I liked grocery shopping. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right? Concerts. Okay. We're getting some great comments in from folks. Camping. Visiting a local brewery, that's one I would love to do. Any other thoughts on where you want to go when you get out of your house? TJ Maxx. <laughs> uh, you opened the floodgates, I think, sir. Yeah, camping by the lake, baseball, great. All good ideas. Oh, my gosh, a haircut. Yes, a woman after my own heart, a hairstylist. Benny Hanna's. <laughs> love it. These are all really super ideas. Any place that you want to go first when you get out of your house, go ahead and share with us. We would love to hear it. Anywhere that is not my house. Ah. <laughs> True. Okay, well, we will come back to that throughout the hour today. Um, keep those ideas coming. Give us a thought where you would like to go when you can get out of your house. The gym, oh, yeah, that's a good one. So welcome, everybody. My name is Jen kovich Bordnick. I'm the CEO of the eHealth Initiative, and we're delighted to have you here today. I'm in sunny Washington, D.C. Um, a beautiful overcast day here, but you're going to get the benefit of the doubt here, and it's going to look like it's sunny, but it is not. Um, so we're going to be talking today about HIEs and the playbook to overcome data challenges during the pandemic. And this is all part of our COVID-19 series which we launched a couple of weeks ago, and really inviting on um, experts, um, key influencers across the healthcare industry to talk about um, what we can do to work on this um, pandemic, how we can address it, what some of the challenges are. And we've got an incredible group with us here today. Claudia, if you want to go to the next slide, and we'll just run through who is joining us here today. Um, we have Kim Chanji, who is the um, Senior Director of Health Information Exchange and Interoperability at Keystone Health Information Exchange, um, KHIE, or part, part of uh, Geisinger. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. Um, HIE has been around a very long time and very effective. Um, Kevin Conway um, with NEHI Data Enterprise Manager, Nebraska Health Information Initiative. There are a lot of um, NEHIs. This is Nebraska. <laughs> And we're delighted to have Kevin here with us today. Cody Johansson, Director of Operations at UHIN, another um, ge geography across the country here. We've got a really broad spectrum, so this is fantastic. Um, Bill Perch, um, who is CIO from Healthy Connect Alaska, um, joining us as well, all the way from Alaska. And we appreciate Bill joining us during this 
um, really big time change for you. <laughs> we know it's early there, so um, thank you for joining us. And Dan Sedan, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Nextgate, and we're delighted that Dan is here with us today. And we're also really um, grateful to Nextgate. Um, Nextgate is actually supporting and underwriting this specific programming today, and, and eHealth Initiative is a very small nonprofit, and we wouldn't be able to put on all these wonderful programs without the support of incredible organizations like Nextgate, so we're very grateful to them. You want to go to the next slide, Claudia? Couple of housekeeping items. Um, Claudia, if you could advance to the next slide, that would be great. So everybody is currently on mute. Um, we do want to get into questions. Um, did anybody else just lose their there we go connection or is that just me um, basically we would like to let everybody know that you are currently on mute um, so if you would like to ask a question today you need to did we just lose uh oh we're still able to hear you but yeah your your video is not coming through. Uh, we're on the right, housekeeping guys. slide. Sorry, Zoom's yeah. having a little bit of issues today. So um, we're going to boot it back up. But I'm glad that you can still hear me. So Claudia will get the um, video back up for us. I know Zoom's been overloaded lately. So housekeeping items. So um, basically, everybody is on mute. If you would like to ask a question, we really want to hear your questions today. So go ahead. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A box. And go ahead in that Q&A box and please feel free to go in and write any questions and we'll get to them at the end. We're going to spend the majority of the time today really talking about um, some, a lot of stuff hopefully I think we'll cover during the discussion, but um, any additional questions we'll get to the, at the end of the program. And then a little bit about eHealth Initiative. We are a nonprofit. Um, our mission is to convene executives around key issues, and this is a key issue that we've been convening around for um, really the last six weeks, I think everybody has been talking about COVID-19 more than anything. Um, generally, we spend time talking about interoperability, privacy and security, um, cost transparency, um, but we've really um, pivoted to try to address right now these really key functions and um, try to figure out, you know, I think the most important thing going on right now is what's happening on the front lines with providers. Um, and clinicians, um, and of course, all of our first responders, and we're grateful to them. Um, so we do want to let them know that we're thinking of them, and we know many of them can't join us here today. Um, but we, our um, hearts go out to them, and, and we do appreciate what they're doing right now. I think what we'd like to do first is um, just go around. We've got a really incredible panel with us here today, and I'd love to just take a few moments for just each of you to tell us about your respected HIE and really focus on, you know, how has this changed um, in terms of how your organization has pivoted over the last month in response to the pandemic. So, um, you know, I think the world's changed for all of us. But um, what specifically is your organization doing, and how did you pivot quickly? And, and why don't we start with um, Kim at um, KHE or um, Geisinger? Kim, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, and thank you again for having me. Um, you know, I'm flattered to be asked to um, sit with such a great uh, cast of characters, I'll call them. Um, but from an our HIE perspective, um, Kihai has been around um, for 12 plus years. Um, we are servicing Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, we have over 6 million, actually we're ready to hit 7 million patients with over 190 some organizations. I think the way we've been able to um, kind of come back and help our facilities and our organizations are in multiple areas. Um, one being um, a heat map. Um, we started collecting data as soon as this um, epidemic um, started with um, focusing on when patients were being tested and if they were positive or negative so that we can bridge a heat gap to show to our um, local facilities um, kind of the path or the course that the epidemic was taking. Um, I think it, that was a huge starting point for many organizations to understand kind of how the path of this virus was going so that they can be proactive instead of reactive. 
Um, and then um, as it goes on, I think we've built in um, additional uh, suggestions or uh, notifications to help our facilities understand where the patients are being seen um, and being um, kind of notified ahead of time if they are a positive um, COVID patient. Okay, thanks for giving us that uh, snapshot. Cody, do you want to tell us about you, Hen? Uh, Cody, can we hear Cody? Claudia, did, is he on mute? Um, I don't think so. Let me check. Okay. I, I think on, <laughs> we've lost a couple of uh, yeah for panelists, but I think they'll be coming back on. Okay. okay. Um, um, I, Cody I just sent Cody. a note. I see, I see Cody yeah. here, though. Let's see. Oh, he lost the, the phone connection, so I, I guess we'll move yeah. on to the next. Yeah. We just had a Verizon surge, so I think a couple of people are probably having the same issue right now. <laughs> um, is Kevin, Kevin, can you hear us? I can hear you. I'm on Verizon, so can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Great. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully the... Yeah. I know. Hopefully it'll come back here soon. I've got my audio, so hopefully my internet will. Um, so, Kevin, tell us about how you guys have pivoted at um, Nehigh. No, uh, thanks, Jeffrey. And this is uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel today as well, so I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the Nebraska Health Information Initiative, or Nehigh as we call ourselves, uh, serves actually Nebraska and Western Iowa, so uh, a multiple geographic area. So we've been in operation since 2009, but really in the last uh, two years we've pivoted uh, beyond just the HIE core activities and started working for population health. And taking that activity uh, really kind of set us up for some of the things we're doing with our COVID response. Uh, the governor's office and our public health department came to NEHI, uh, and we've had a good partnership with them over the years. They came to NEHI to see how we could support. So we've been standing up a, a number of dashboards for them, uh, basic dashboards that you would expect an HIE can do with like ADT uh, admission information and uh, and, uh, for the hospitals and where the where the patients are being admitted from, but we're also able also able to match it with our lab data, and so we're able to do COVID uh, admissions as well. And we're linking it with our chronic conditions um, algorithm, so we can identify those patients that are being admitted that also have chronic conditions, and post admission if they're being readmitted or or reseen in clinics, et cetera. Uh, we also have our PDMP program. Uh, Nebraska's PDMP is unique and it includes more than just the scheduled drugs. It actually includes all medications dispensed for Nebraska. So we're able to pull in some of the medication information as well to our dashboards uh, for our, our, our individuals to look at. So we're, we're working on that. We are also working on reducing the burden of report, reporting for our providers. Uh, there's a number of uh, entities, as you can guess, that are asking for various pieces of information. So. If we can provide uh, uh, that information to that, that outside a agency that's asking for data, we'll be providing that for our, our participants. Uh, and likewise, if they're reporting to some other agency uh, and we can use that for our dashboards, we're pulling that in. So the, the providers and the hospitals are only having to report to one facility or one entity if they can. So. Great. Excellent. Um, Bill, this are you with This is Cody. I'm sorry I'm back on. Back. I hung up there. <laughs> no problem. Cody, um, do you want to um, tell us how your organization has pivoted over the last month? You, Hen? Sure. Yeah, sorry about that again. I apparently hung up instead of unmuting myself, so <laughs> make sure to not do that again. So, um, so you, Hen, actually started as a clearinghouse over 25 years ago, um, and then within the last 10 years, the community decided to uh, set up an HIE as well as part of you, Hen. So for the last 10 years, you, Hen, has been running an HIE in addition to the claims clearinghouse that we run. We're also the state designated HIE for the entire state of Utah, so we cover all of Utah. We also cover a small portion of Southwest Wyoming and a few parts of Montana since there's a lot of patients that come to Utah to seek care from those areas. Uh, UHIN also participates in the Patient Center Data Home Initiative that's part of CHIC, which is a group of uh, HIEs and the patient Center data home connects HIEs across America so that we can all share information. And the majority of the HIEs on this uh, meeting are actually part of that as well. So the biggest thing that we've done though in the last month to pivot is we've worked on our alerting system. Most HIEs have some type of an event-based notification alerting system. 
and we have updated ours to not only do event-based notifications off of admins, discharge, and transfers, but we've also augmented that functionality to be able to provide lab results as part of the alerts that we send out as, as well. Great, um, Bill. So I think the big change for the Alaska HIE, we're the we're the state designated HIE in Alaska. Um, the big change is the state and public health really starting to recognize uh, that they've had this tool available to them for a long time that they didn't really take advantage of, and they haven't quite figured out how to take advantage of yet. And so the, the big change is becoming a, a trusted advisor for some of the epidemiology team and for public health nursing who does a lot of the uh, interviews and the investigative work uh, to uh, help them do their job a little bit easier. Um, and, and I think in many cases it's uh, really bringing some recognition that uh, hospitals, physicians, uh, public health has uh, really been letting, in many cases, a tool kind of sit on the sidelines waiting for a solution, uh, waiting for a problem to, to come up. Um, and now that the problem is there, they're like, oh, heck, we got to figure out how to use this. Uh, so I think that's really the big pivot that we're seeing here. Great. Well, let's dive in a little bit deeper here in terms of specific reporting. I know, Bill, so you just mentioned um, some of the specific data and types that you're collecting. Can you talk about how you're assisting with um, or supporting reporting in your community, either through to public health or um, with provider groups, um, all of that kind of tracking piece. So what role are you doing in that and how are you supporting that? Well, in, in Alaska, the big thing is the recognition that uh, lab systems haven't been uh, well-maintained as far as link coding is concerned and uh, getting that information out of, uh, for example, the state lab uh, has been something that the state has not really addressed in the last uh, 20 years. Um, and so we have all these islands of information uh, that uh, here as we have hit the pandemic are like, we can't get it out. We can't get it there, but we see how we could and we see what the value is. And so I think it's becoming a springboard so that eventually we'll receive uh, labs from Quest and from LabCorp as well as from the state lab. And that'll become more of an issue and more of a, something of importance to those organizations uh, as we enter late summer and early fall when everybody's somewhat expecting a second go around of all of these fun and games that we're experiencing now. Yeah, Kim, do you want to touch on that a little bit? You talked about a lot of the data that you're pulling together, but how are you um, assisting with kind of the reporting and analysis and tracking of the whole pandemic? Sure, um, I think there's like a lot of um, tracking going on out there um, from many different types of the organizations. Um, just here in Pennsylvania, you know, we have um, our uh, facilities tracking their information, but then we have DOH tracking information. We have um, e-health tra tracking information. We have HAP tracking information. But when you come down to it, I think everybody's asking for almost the same data set. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, every two days, um, we have a, um, a list of questions that the state has sent us um, for us to track. Um, number of uh, patients that were tested, number of patients that are positive, number of patients that um, were negative, their age, their race, their county, and their zip code. Um, and then we're uh, trending that and um, adding it to a dashboard so that we continue to look to try to see where the path of the um, pandemic is going, as well as um, are we starting to see it um, subside in certain areas. Um, one of the things I think that hit us the most is um, there was a misconception that key, um, the HIEs had all the data, and, and indeed that's not the case. I think it gives us a great opportunity to go back now after this experience and try and capture those data elements that we did not have and that people have been asking for. Something so easy as how many ICU beds are there in each of the organizations and how many uh, ventilators they have. Um, and how many are in use. 
So that's not something that uh, at least um, our HIE was capturing, but I think moving forward um, to be better prepared for a potential, you know, new um, pandemic, I think that is something that we need to be able to go out and get because we have everybody connected and we need to go back and look at what we were missing. And um, hopefully if this ever happens again, and God, I hope it doesn't, um, we're better prepared. That's a really great point. I'm just going to ask um, Kevin and Cody to jump in on that. Are there um, data or elements um, that you feel like you could collect that you weren't currently collecting, like Kim was alluding to there, um, that might be helpful with this? Cody, do you want to? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think Kim brought up some two really good ones, which is number of ICU beds and number of ventilators. You know, because most HIEs do get ADT feeds from a lot of different organizations, we can somewhat extrapolate the data, but um, a lot of the organizations have actually been shifting beds. So they might have only had a few ICO, ICU beds before, but they've created space for that. And we just don't know that. We can't really know that in an ADT feed. We can know who's in there, but we can't really tell if they've expanded their ability to, to uh, have more beds or whatnot. So well, those are two big items that, um, HI, that at least we at UHIN haven't been able to collect and uh, would be useful information. Yeah, early in the stage, this is Kevin, early in the stage of our response to COVID, we realized that was an issue. So we actually started a bed board dashboard and we started collecting um, bed rosters from the hospitals as we're calling them. So what are their staff beds? What are their available beds? And then we're matching that against our ADT feeds to know what beds are occupied. Um, for those that are giving us uh, ADT feeds, we can determine that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of data in those in those feeds, and historically, we've used portions of it. Uh, we've displayed portions of it for our for our participants. But uh, a good example uh, where we need to work on our our completeness is patient location. Some of that information coming in really doesn't tell us what bed they're in. It just says that they're in a bed. So if we're trying to match it against the bed roster, against patient location, we need to beef up those ADTs and, and work on that data completeness. But uh, that's one of our dashboards we're working on is, is, is an occupancy percentage for specifically ICU and ED occupancy. Uh, we do collect uh, the other bed classifications, but uh, we're focusing on those two um, for, our, for our participants. That's a fantastic idea. Would you be willing to share kind of a, a picture of what that dashboard looks like? Or um... yeah, the slides I sent you earlier, Jen. One of the uh, one of the one of the slide shots is uh, based upon that dashboard, an okay. occupancy percentage. So um, we can share those more broadly on our um, resource center online if folks are interested in that. I'm sure they will be just to get a look at what that looks like. I think that's great, and the more we can share. Um, I think that's why we're here. And Dan, let me just tell you, jump in here wherever you've got a question or a thought here. <laughs> I know this is your No, area. absolutely. I, it's, uh, I'm just you know, very, very proud to hear what, what our customers are, are doing, and they're very much at the forefront of this. So I'm staying back a little bit just to, uh, to allow the audience to hear it you know, directly from, from our clients. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question here, um, talking about some of the biggest barriers to COVID-19 data collection. Um, and I do want to remind folks, if you have a question, go ahead and insert it there at the bottom in the Q&A section. Just type it in there, and we will get to it at the end. I know we've got a couple coming in, but we welcome as many as, as we can get to. Um, so biggest barriers to collecting data. Um, is it information blocking? Is it contracts? Is it privacy issues? What are some of the barriers you've had? Um, just oper you know, technical interoperability issues. I'm really curious to hear um, on that. Bill, do you want to kick us off on that one? Sure, I can talk a little bit of that. Um, I think one of the biggest barriers that we've encountered is uh, with is from the state side of things. Uh, the state not being sure what they can and should share. Um, and what that means as far as their responsibility for the, the data that they're putting out into the public. Um, the state uh, produces a, um, a cohort of patients that they've identified as being COVID positive. But one of the concerns that they have is if they identify a patient within the HIE as being COVID positive, what does that mean to that patient should they go to seek medical care? Uh, because there for a long time, uh, most states were having a very difficult time in identifying when someone was no longer 
COVID positive. And so having somebody stigmatized with a COVID diagnosis, uh, they were quite concerned that that might lead to someone not receiving care that they needed because someone thought they might be COVID positive. Uh, and on the flip side of that, the, the how do you get somebody off of the COVID list uh, was something that they were uh, pretty concerned about. Since uh, you can't say, well, you've got COVID for five days and you're done, because uh, it doesn't really work that way. Um, but uh, so the, the state was really trying to figure out if it could present that information in a meaningful way so that then it could be provided to care providers at the point of care. So that, that was probably one of, one of the biggest barriers. The other large barrier was that nobody wanted to actually code things consistently uh, for quite some time. So you had local codes coming out of everywhere and trying to figure out what one facility's code was versus another facility's code uh, took quite a bit of time and it seemed to change on a regular basis. Interesting. Interesting. And I wouldn't have even thought about that kind of not being coded as a COVID patient. So how do you get off that list? That's an interesting um, point. How did you guys figure that out? What was the We haven't yet. Mean? We're still working on it. <laughs> so let me just well, ask. Oh, yeah, the I'm trying to jump in on that. Just, just to jump in a little bit on that one. I mean, what what Bill is bringing up is, uh, is something you know outside of the kind of uh, current pandemic. You know, is is an issue that we've seen generally with uh, when it comes to patient identity. That, you know, certain things are considered um, you know, kind of sensitive information, and uh, it's been one of the reasons we've been very reluctant to kind of intermix uh, information from too many sources external to the healthcare institutions that are participating you know, in the exchange or at the, at the, at the institution, because, um, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely the concern that on, on one hand with patient privacy, if you start to aggregate data too much, you get into kind of a surveillance state mode. On the other hand, you know, we heard earlier that, uh, you know, patients are moving from state to state and, and creating boundaries and barriers between states is not always very helpful. So it's a, it's a very interesting problem and this just highlights that problem even more. So uh, yeah, absolutely what Bill brought up is, is something we've heard quite often in the past. Cody, you wanna jump in on this? Um, some yeah, um, I, I think I can definitely echo Bill on the variability in the data and that being an issue. You know, there were all kinds of new local codes just because of how, how rapidly the situation evolved. But even once people started to use more standardized codes, there's still some confusion on what codes to use, which, which versions and everything. And uh, I think most people probably know this by now, but there are actually multiple different coronavirus strains. So you can't just go off of just a text search for something like coronavirus because there are other uh, variants of coronavirus. So uh, we've actually had to struggle with that a little bit here at UHIN and, and finally kind of figured out which ones to include and which ones to exclude. But in the beginning, you know, there were even people ordering the wrong coronavirus test because they just said, oh, it's a coronavirus test, right? Rather than, well, it's the specific variant of the coronavirus. So that was, uh, has kind of been a, a big barrier for us as well. Um, you know, we, we've actually not had too much with any, you know, data blocking or the, the privacy type things because I think that people have understood the, the gravity of the situation and, and the, the importance of staying in front of it. So uh, to me, the issues that we've experienced here more in, in Utah are more around the variability of the data and, and just little nuances in it, so. Okay, great. Um, Kim, you wanna jump in on that? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, echo the same that, that Bill and uh, Cody had mentioned about, you know, the, the real coding of, of what's going on. But I wanna kind of take a different twist to it, um, a barrier that, uh, you don't realize what well, I never realized it was there. So um, each facility, each organization is doing their best to track, you know, their patients and, um, you know, uh, their contacts and who they've been in contact with. Each organization is trying to make sure their employees are safe. And if they are being tested, they're being routed to, you know, um, employee health so that they can be tracked. Um, we now have our, um, the state coming out and opening up multiple sites and locations for um, you know, first responders and healthcare workers and patients to go get um, tested. Um, 
with that being said, there's no t um, connection back to the organizations. So, um, you know, I think th the intent was it was, you know, a good thought. We have to get them tested quickly, quicker. Um, but I think it now is going to um, not allow the organizations to bridge and track their um, communities more effectively because you could have communities now, members now going out to different sites and locations that um, are not connected to the, I'll say the cohort or to the hub and spoke wheel um, because of their technical capabilities are, are um, not as advanced as, as others are. So I was a little discouraged to see that, but you know, knowing that it's, it's the right thing to do um, and hopefully we're going to work towards how we can electronically make that happen um, so that no, no matter where the patient goes in Pennsylvania, um, you know, all of the uh, downstream systems would be able to support them and know um, how to help treat them. And then the last one is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, the last thing I think we, we really have to uh, also identify as something that we could overcome and do better is once we're tracking them and they are positive, um, uh, are we actually doing a case investigation on them of who were they exposed to, who were they around, and notifying those um, people so that they can, um, you know, go and get tested or be aware that they may have been exposed So that contract. Um, tracing is, is super important. Let me ask you guys this. Um, one of the questions that come in, has come in is whether or not you're able to track providers as part of your um, tracking. Is anybody doing that? Providers as being um, uh, who's ordering them or? Yeah, who's able, uh, in terms of resources, who's able to come in or helping to track, find um, contact providers. Um, it's part of the, the response. Reaching out so I think to all hands, yeah, so all hands been on deck from, from our organization. Um, if there were um, clinics or sites or locations that were closed simply because you're trying to, you know, um, keep the, the gestion, the traffic down, um, those physicians have been, have been rerouted to different locations to handle um, larger volumes of where patients are coming in and being seen. And then we're also picking up who their PCPs are um, in the data set um, to allow that communication to happen as well. Great. Um, and Ali is just reminding me from our staff that um, there are lots of resource slides. I know we're not getting into as much detail as everybody would like, but on um, the EHI website from all of these different organizations, um, there are resource slides. So you can get into much more detail if you want to learn more about um, uh, Key or um, UHIN or any of these organizations, um, that information is available for you. So, I mean, it sounds like you guys have kind of delved into some really interesting um, projects or collaborations, and I'm just curious what the reception has been from some of your partners. Have they all been, um, I, I know people are very willing to help and um, jump on board right now because of the pandemic, but people are also very overloaded and, and trying to do 100 things at once. So I'm just kind of wondering what the reception has been like from some of your um, technology partners in terms of having just even the capacity to be able to help um, support some of these projects. Um, why don't we start with Kevin? Thanks, Jen. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, it, it's a great question because going into this, we didn't know what type of reception we would get both from our, our, um, our community stakeholders, our, our participants, and our, par our vendor partners. Uh, I'd have to say at this point, overwhelmingly, our vendor partners have been very supportive and uh, doing a lot of uh, 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 back bends to, to make sure they can accommodate our, our asks. We're in the middle of a major platform migration, moving from one HIE platform to another HIE platform we, when this started, the COVID response started. Uh, both vendors, the one we're migrating from and the one we're migrating to, uh, we're both uh, are doing great things for us, uh, responding to our requests that are honestly changing on a daily basis. Uh, we have uh, multiple conference calls a week with our or with our community stakeholders that are adding on additional demands. And so, something that we talked about Monday, we now have a new request coming in on a Wednesday request um, 
project uh, that we have to add on top of that. And so our partners have been have been wonderful in responding to that. Um, standing up uh, AWS uh, instances and not charging us for those is a good example because uh, we need, you know, we're in the middle of, of developing uh, uh, testing environments and we needed to take the testing environment and use it for uh, part of our pro production because we didn't have true production up and running. So those type of efforts, uh, I, I cannot commend them enough for what they're doing for, for our uh, efforts. Really great to hear. Um, Cody, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, uh, I just echo that too, that it, everyone has been extremely supportive. You know, one data source that we're working with, it's taken several years to just get connected and get stuff going. And within a matter of weeks, they're going to have COVID tests flowing to us. So it's, you know, just, just really change things. And it's been really, really um, very supportive just to help also give you some more numbers. I always like data and numbers. So we just announced on Friday, last Friday, the 17th, about our ability to, to do COVID results, COVID alerting. And by then, or since then, we've had 71 subscriptions already set up for COVID alerts. So there's a, there's a, a high demand for the information. And We've had a great support from all of the partners in the tech community and everybody around us being able to help us support that so that we can uh, meet that demand. Um, let's see, Kevin, did we get, uh, Ken, Ken, thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, just like uh, the other panelists have said, I think everyone has come to the table um, who, whatever vendor you're speaking with, they're always there willing to help and, and see what we can do next, um, especially with not just planning on what's going on right now, um, but actually doing, you know, recovery planning. I, you know, I think it's critical that we start to identify in our areas that recovering plan is going to be critical to our organizations and that our vendors are going to pay, play a key role in, in us being able to recover and survive and get back to what we will now consider a normal state. That's great. You know, one of the things I was watching on actually CNN today was they were talking about interoperability and I thought, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> interoperability, about the ability that you have all these labs around the country trying to connect and send in information and their IT systems are not um, as advanced. So, you know, one of the advantages um, you folks have as health information exchange is that you're a centralized infrastructure basically in place. Um, so I think people are finally going to recognize, oh, there is an organization that, that does that and, and plays that role. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the interoperability, um, I guess, um, uh, issues that you've been able to resolve or they are still kind of tricky um, for you that have really been highlighted, I guess, by this um, pandemic. And, and some of the advantages that you have really as an HIE, I think, um, to fi facilitate some of that. Um, Bill? Um, I think that one of the advantages that we have is if we receive information, if we receive data, uh, we can figure out figure out how to get it to where it needs to go, um, and that that is you know that is the idea behind the HIE, right? With notifications, if we're receiving information in a in a structured form, we we can develop uh, notifications based around the information as as well. I, I think uh, one of the things that we we are identifying is that. Uh, the HIE is not the EHR. And so just because hospital X places information Y in a patient's chart does not mean it automatically winds up in, uh, in the HIE. And in many cases, should it? Maybe not. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the recognition that there's this advantage that if the information comes to us, we can exchange it and we can get it to where it needs to go. But then the flip side of that is um, if you send us too much information, is it actually going to be useful? Is it going to be something that can be acted on? Can it be dissected and used for, uh, used for changing the course of someone's care? Or is it just data that winds up in a database someplace? Great. Let's go to Kevin. 
Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, as Bill pointed out, uh, heightened the, the core you know, role of an HIE, that is the interoperability sharing of clinical information, uh, informed clinician, as I like to go back to the original words in high tech. Um, so it's kind of heightened that uh, piece of information before there was a good understanding from some of the community uh, that the HIE could play in that. Uh, now there's an increased understanding of, of the information that can be shared back and forth between um, providers and participants. Um, but it also has, has heightened our role in that cross-community data aggregation or synthesizer of data. You know, Bill was talking about labs before, and, and that's, that's still a constant issue. Um, some of those national lab companies are still not reporting labs, but we're able to take that information um, and, and, and uh, decipher it for the other individuals. Uh, some of our participants are using local code, so we get their uh, lab compendium. So we're able to, to link those back and forth to a common language from this setting to that setting so individuals uh, can understand or get a complete picture of what's happening to that patient without having to go through, through blocks and blocks of data and, and reading text to figure out what was really done with that patient. And so the HIE has that capability of taking that cross-community, linking those p patients uh, uh, from from different hospitals is, is, is a challenge enough, but you think about coming from a, a, from a prescription program or a lab report that has uh, not nearly as much data as, as a hospital typically would on that patient, linking those together to make sure we're linking that lab result or that test result and giving our partners not only lab, uh, uh, labs done but or, or denominators and enumerators on the lab test. So I, I think that's really uh, been one of the uh, major ahas in, in people I have not been familiar with what we're doing in Nebraska, is that we can do that for them. I mean, one of the things that you've alluded to and Bill mentioned earlier is the whole issue around um, managing patient identification and the importance of you know, the HIE's role really in that. Dan, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of um, the data quality and um, being able to deal with these identity issues in terms of reporting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you're hearing as far as interoperability goes is really underpinned uh, by, by patient identity because a lot of the, the data is coming from multiple streams, multiple systems, multiple hospitals, um, each with their own kind of you know, local view of, of patient identity. That, that's how we do it today in the United States. It's likely how we're going to do it you know, for, for quite a while. Um, and, and that's why, uh, you know, as Kevin was saying about, uh, you know, denominators and numerators, uh, I think it's, you know, in order to come out with statistics and analytics um, and also, you know, in order to allow for some of these use cases around event notification and such, um, you really do have to have a very good sense of patient identity. And, and we've seen, you know, coming into this crisis, a lot of our customers have reached out to us to kind of warn us ahead of time that their usage of, um, you know, the, the master patient index is likely to increase because the number of queries that they need to issue in order to handle, um, you know, the kind of information flows that, that they're looking to do is, is going to be, you know, quite significant. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Patient identity is, is, a, is a critical piece of this uh, in order to support these, uh, uh, these capabilities. Yeah. I want to follow up on that a little bit because there is a question here um, from an audience member about the challenges around patient ID and matching. Um, and let me see here. And other uh, conditions related to the COVID prognosis. Um, and we know that HIEs across the U.S. are starting to work with EMS and fire. And sometimes there are mismatches. Um, sometimes there's dirty data. Um, you know, with everybody so busy right now, Dan, what do you think kind of the best way you can suggest for folks that try to attack and resolve some of these issues right now um, when the need is really urgent? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of uh, if, if, a, if an investment hasn't been made by an organization to, uh, to deal with patient identity, it's a little bit difficult in the short term, uh, you know, to, to, to do much about it. It, it. At that point, you're just kind of fighting a fire. Um, but... I think it highlights the fact that, um, you know, an interoperable layer among patient identity must be very easy to bring on additional sources and integrate additional sources. Uh, you know, as we heard earlier, certain timescales have been expedited by, by some of our customers, some of them quite significantly, you know, and, and in order to kind of to, to, to reach those, those deadlines, which uh, really are essentially yesterday, 
Um, you know, you have to have a good infrastructure in place as best as possible to leverage the, the standards that are available uh, around patient identity to, um, you know, to get a grip on it. Because if we look at the statistics today, you know, at, at this point, I think we're, we're well under 1% of the U.S. population, you know, having been tested or, or, or having been diagnosed. And, uh, and so the, the, the numerator, you know, when you're doing analytics is, you know, not that significant. The denominator, we know how many people are living you know, in a region or in the United States. But as tests are repeated, and as we're getting to a state where some people have, um, you know, overcome the illness, but maybe become reinfected, or we don't know exactly how the, the disease progresses from here, uh, then not being able to aggregate everything to, to a single individual, the, the single patient identity really, I think, is going to impact, you know, analytics and, and also other kinds of use cases that, that affect patient care. You know, Jen, you bring up EMS, and and we had we had started integrating with our or our EMS services here in Nebraska before the COVID response. And one of the things we realized early on is their their response is not to a person; it's to an address. Mm. Um, yeah. First responders, and EMS, and it it comes out in the COVID as well. So uh, they need to know what the situation is they're going into. Uh, so it's it's important that you not only carry that patient matching, so you get the right clinical results and the right lab results matched together. You also have to make sure you have the proper address demographics for that patient, so we know uh, where that patient truly resides and what other connections that patient has to that residence. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. That the the, the topic of of location uh, and location intelligence, I guess as we term it, or address intelligence, is is really. Um, is unique, you know, as, as a data element, uh, it, it really ties a lot of different things together. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely knowing the, the patient's uh, address down to the rooftop so that you know who's in the household and, uh, you know, and who is, who is likely or, or potentially likely to be infected at that address is, is absolutely important. One of the things we've been getting questions on, um, we've been talking about a lot of extra things that these HIEs have taken on. Are any of the states providing um, you any financial support to take on these added um, projects and, and roles? Anybody can jump in there. Anybody can say yes to that question? <laughs> it's been promised, but there's no, nothing. Okay. I think um, it's been more towards the hospitals and the providers, not towards the um, health information exchange, um, but I would like to see that um, potentially open up as a, uh, an opportunity. Okay, and who was that that said it's been promised? Was that in Nebraska? Oh, or? That was in Alaska. Uh, it, it's Alaska. been a discussion um, that any expenses that we experience in, in responding to the state's COVID requirements our, our work will will wind up getting uh, made whole, if you will, at the end. Yeah, and in Nebraska too, our partners have been good about supporting what we're doing. So our state partners. That's fantastic. That's really good to hear. What about um, federal agencies? So anybody have thoughts about what ONC or other federal agencies could do to kind of advance some of these response efforts? I think one thing they, they probably should do is, is pay attention to what's going on at the local level. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I talked earlier about burden on providers and, and facilities, and I'll jump back on that soapbox a little bit because we've seen some things come out or where there's certain mandates for reporting things at the federal level that's already being reported on the local level. Um, uh, and they've made some efforts to include that. Um, they use the term certified, but the local uh, system has to be certified. But uh, uh, you know, all these individuals are scrambling around trying to take care of COVID, trying to respond to COVID. Their resources are being uh, stripped as well uh, because of their, their, their financial and, and staff are either getting quarantined themselves uh, and then to add additional burden on top of that for reporting purposes just tasks them a little bit too much. So, Anybody tracking for recovery? Hmm. We, one of our dashboards does track recovery, so uh, using the definition of 30 days post-diagnosis. So those patients have recovered, and that's part of our um, ADT um, uh, tracking dashboard. Excellent. Anyone else? Yeah, um, recovery as well as um, um, making sure, you know, do they get reinfected um, 
and what's that percentage looking like. So um, those are great um, data elements that I think we'll continue to be tracking for a long time. Um, and Kim, so you piqued our interest here from a couple of different folks here. Um, so when you, were you saying that you're involved in contact tracing in Pennsylvania? So um, part of the organization's um, mechanism when connecting or when capturing um, the re, uh, the actual test from the original site is taking account of who they are around, um, who they are in contact with, and being aware of that. Um, also, from the facility organization, if one of our employees um, are infected. Um, I think it's critical for us to go back and look to see um, the surroundings and who who were they taking care of at that time. Well, this, this is Cody. One actually kind of unique use case that we've seen here is that there's actually been a demand for uh, updated contact information for uh, people that have either tested positive or uh, are having tests. So, you know, the, the place where they actually got tested might not have the most current information that's just been a unique scenario that I think an HIE can fill that's actually been very helpful and we've seen uh, uh, work out very well here. And I think that that will be an important part in the recovery effort as well, though. And I can't remember who was talking about the EMS before. Was it Bill or Cody? Um, I think it was Okay, is, is anybody tracking um, in terms of EMS exposure among EMS providers or um, among yeah, we were, that was me talking about Nebraska's EMS project, and uh, to my knowledge, we're not tracking EMS providers themselves, and are they being exposed? So we, we are, that's our next, that's our we next are, dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Cody from UHIN, and we aren't necessarily tracking that, but uh, going back to the alerts that we've set up, it's, uh, we, we see that as key as in preventing it. Um, exposure and we've actually one of the clinic systems that we've worked with they actually have told us about um, twice now with two separate individuals where people have tested positive for COVID-19 have come in for an appointment and waited until they actually met the doctor so they've come in they've checked in talked to the front desk talked to a nurse and then finally talked to the doctor and not until they've talked to the doctor have they you know revealed that they've had a positive test and so, you know, those that clinic system has got, had to go back and quarantine that staff and and, and whatnot. And uh, but, you know, being in an HIE and, and knowing the the patients and, and who they're working with, being able to do the alerts has been helpful for that. So it's not necessarily tracking it, but being able to prevent that from even happening in the first place is a unique use case for us. But. Another question here, are your geographies using the Pulse emergency portal, and if so, how are you connecting to that? Anyone? We, we are not. Um, Alaska is a big enough, small enough state and that uh, connecting to Pulse um, doesn't have a significant advantage for the state um, to integrate multiple HIE uh, resources. Um, if uh, we had more mobility and as we were, for example, to get into uh, summer, if the tourists were actually to come and visit our state, please come and visit our state, um, <laughs> then something like Pulse would be very useful for, for gathering that information from a more uh, regional or national uh, perspective. And we've been having this, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please finish. And we in Nebraska, we've been having conversations about connecting with Pulse as well, as well. Uh, um, not necessarily for COVID, but for some of the other uh, initiatives we're undertaking, uh, more more tied to our PDMP than our actual HIE, if you think about that way, uh, so they can get a person's medication history uh, when they're responding. But nothing has been formalized and no connections have been made. Anybody else have a Pulse connection? You can do that. Hi, does not either. Okay, Bill, back to your dashboard, which is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the occupancy tracking dashboard, in what structure are you capturing that data and at what frequency do you capture it? That's an interesting thought. I 
they're probably out directing that at me at Nebraska, not Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, depending on the, the level of participation from the facility, some of it is, is actually real time. We're bringing in ADT messages as they're happening. Some of it's a daily process, so we're getting a, an occupancy report from the facility on a daily basis, depending on the status of their ADT. So it varies across. So. And we have a technology partner that we worked with on our other public health initiatives that is developing that dashboard for us as a platform. Fantastic. Is anybody sharing COVID data across the um, Sequoia network? Um, okay. So How this about is Cody. I might, yeah, I might be able to jump in. I mean, I guess we are because the way that that works yeah. is if someone queries us and we have that COVID result, then we would, you know, include that in the document that we provide back to them. Um, so in a query response fashion, we are, but we're not actively pushing it across the sure. Sequoia network. Are any of you guys thinking about doing that in the long term? Okay. Um, another question, I knew this was going to come up. So does it make sense to design duplicate data streams? So as we know, a number of large vendors are um, have health data clouds in place. Yeah. Wellness data, um, and they can take data as long as patients provide permissions to enable access due to health concerns. So, are any of you thinking about um, connecting with some of those larger groups? Um, you know, our Apple's, Microsoft, Google, Fitbit, et cetera, and connecting to some of that geo data and wellness data. This is Kim. I think um, from our perspective, um, that is going to be part of our post mortem. Um, review of um, what can we do now, what can we do better, um, but I definitely think that is a huge opportunity um, that we should look into and um, see how we can invest in that. Anyone else? Yeah, I think this is Kevin, and I think that's one of the core, another another uh, yep. functionality of an HIE is, is you know, being able to be that data um, source or reuse, repurpose that data. I shouldn't say repurpose, that's probably the wrong phrase. But uh, if there are things like patient portals or, or the vaults are talking about that can use that data instead of having to do those uh, connections, we can be that point of connection for those organizations. And obviously as a privacy advocate, I always wanna point out that it's really underneath the patient's control and the patient's consent that we need to consider those type of uses. Are any of you able to collect telehealth visit data um, or any data from some of these mobile testing sites, um, any of the surge facilities, so the tents that you know are out there, the convention centers? Has anybody figured out a way to kind of connect to those um, you know, temporary remote sites? Well, they're just another, I hate to say it this way, but just another data source. I mean, and data source being handled by uh, a host system. Uh, in our case, Providence Health uh, Systems has, uh, they have a drive-through testing site. Um, and that all their information from that testing site winds up going into their EPIC instance. And so we get ADT uh, messages, we get lab results uh, come across in their ORU feed. Uh, so we were simply treating them as another, just a data source. Okay. We even see that up in uh, in the tents and, and beds and stuff in our bed boards. So they'll just create temporary bed definitions, temporary units for, for those uh, stand-up conditions. Wow, that makes sense. Yep. And we did the same. So. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it just points points out to that infrastructure layer. You know, it's just another stream of, of information and patient yes. identity. So it's really not... Kind of, I wouldn't say it's a trivial problem, but it's not any different than other streams, really. Just more temporary in nature. Um, one thing, the CDC just unveiled the Firebase COVID-19 EHR reporting application. Um, as federal government, of course, they had a very long name for it. <laughs> um, are any of you guys going to be um, using this, or do you think it will impact um, your, your process at all? Any thoughts on that? It's not something I've had a chance to review yet. 
I think it, I think it's something we're all going to have to uh, uh, take time to look at and see how it could um, benefit or be in addition to. So um, that's on our to-do list. Okay, great. Um, what about supply chain? Um, is anybody getting engaged with any of the supply chain issues around um, contact surveillance? to help support contact surveillance. Anybody taking supply chain data in their HIE? That was one of those um, no. things that I said that we are not collecting that we potentially should collect. Um, you know, the most obvious is the um, ventilators, but knowing and going through this, um, there are definitely supply issues or constraints that we should be able to make each other know about and be aware of so that it could maybe be monitored more proactively through, you know, a mechanism where they can see the community supply at large. Have any of you guys been collaborating with other HIEs, um, interstate um, HIEs? I know some of you are regional in nature, but um, has there been kind of more collaboration between the different um, organizations? And most definitely on, on several levels, besides the, the you know, the, the being able to exchange patient information back and forth across regions, as we talked about earlier, and those, those have been evolving over the, over the time period, uh, just how we're answering some of these questions. So there are several special networking opportunities or groups that have gotten together on a weekly basis to talk about what are they doing, how are they solving these technical issues or some of the not quite technical but involved technology things of, of uh, being able to make these connections. And um, from Pennsylvania, um, we meet weekly now. Um, the, all the HIEs in Pennsylvania come to the table and discuss um, what we're doing and how we could do better and how we can assist and help each other. This is incredible. And we, we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, I think you know, this has been incredibly valuable. I've got 20 more questions I would love to go through, but um, <laughs> we're running out of time here. Um, I do want to remind folks we are going to put more detail. We've got wonderful slide sets as background from all of these different um, organizations, and we are going to post those on the website. And I did want to give um, Dan just an opportunity. I mean, Dan, you have assembled an incredible group of organizations here for us today. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you and Nextgate for that yeah. again. And I guess as someone who's working with all of these organizations, do you have any kind of final thoughts in terms of um, – the role that th these organizations have played and, and, and what they might be able to do um, in the future. Well, just uh, first off, I just want to say thank you to, to Cody, Bill, Kevin, and, and Kim. I know that they're, they're very busy right now and uh, really appreciate them uh, taking the time to, to kind of broadcast what it is that they're doing and their best practices and the challenges that they have. Um, you know, we see our, our customers as, as partners. Uh, we you know, try to listen to, to their needs and concerns, and, and uh, both from the perspective of implementation and services and, and, and also product. Um, so, you know, I just, uh, going forward, I, I know that this uh, pandemic is certainly going to challenge all of these organizations. It might drive us to make, um, you know, changes in the way we do business, and that may make changes in how we service our customers or, or even in our products. So uh, I just, um, you know, we're, we're there for uh, all of these organizations and we just hope that we all get through it. Great. Thanks, Dan. And thanks, NextGate. And thanks to all of our HIEs who are really playing a critical role in terms of getting the information to everybody that needs to have it. I mean, really underscore the value of um, each of you and your organization. So thank you for helping us with this pandemic. We appreciate it. Greatly. And um, that's going to end our webinar today. Um, again, feel free to download that information. Um, thanks to our wonderful speakers today. Um, thank you, Nextgate, and hope everybody um, is doing okay and stay healthy and safe. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Stay safe.